Uh, good morning, folks. My name is Dewar McLeod. I'm a professor of history here and co-chair of the committee putting together this conference. Um, thank you all for coming to see our keynote speaker. Uh, it's quite a treat. And uh, let me first introduce our provost, um, Dr. Warren G. Sandman, provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. Uh, the provost, in case you don't know, is the chief academic officer for the university and oversees all undergraduate and graduate programs responsible for leading the development and implementation of academic planning for the university. Which means he's not the guy you go to to complain about your grade, but he's one of the people you want to thank for the great education you're getting here. Um, that and your professors. Um, uh, Dr. Sandman came to us last year and his major academic agenda here at William Patterson is to focus on student success. In particular, he is leading the current Finish in Four initiatives. So please welcome Provost Dr. Warren Sandman. Well, thank you. And this is a very, very good conference here. I was just noting and, and chatting with our keynote speaker here, the quality of speakers and the quality of the conference that the College of Humanities and Social Sciences is able to bring here every year is just amazing. And I just want to thank the dean for her hard work and also all of her committee members who probably really did all the hard work for this as well, too. So thank you very much for putting this together. Uh, you know, today, yeah, give them a hand. <laughs> you know, today's topic reminds me of that well-known proverb, may you live in interesting times. We in education and we as a culture are living in very interesting times these days especially in terms of higher education and what's happening with higher education in terms of how technology is changing, how we think, how we act, how we respond to each other, and to a large extent, how we are as a people. We see this in the changes in industries and businesses. We've seen what's happened to journalism. We're seeing what's happened to music. We're seeing what's happening to TV. And we're starting to see this impact on education as well, too. And I'm sure our speaker today will be talking about a number of these issues. We see this here at our campus as well, too. And this is something that's important to us as we focus on your success as students and how we best prepare you for this new world that you'll be entering here. So I'm sure that today's presentation, as well as the session this morning and sessions later this afternoon, will be excellent in addressing and looking at this issue and how it affects all of us here. So welcome to today's event. Thank you. Uh, now it is quite an honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, and bear with me, it's going to take me a little while just to read his accomplishments here. Uh, David Theo Goldberg, PhD, is the director of the University of California Humanities Research Institute. He is also executive director of the Research Hub in Digital Media and Learning the International Center Coordinating All Research for the MacArthur Foundation Initiative in Connected Learning. He is a professor in comparative literature and criminology, law, and society, and an affiliate professor of anthropology at UC Irvine. He has received fellowships from, among others, the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the Hearst Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Those are just the ones that I'd heard of. Um, he has written extensively on digital media's impact on higher education, on race and racism, law and society, and on critical theory. His most recent books include Sites of Race, Conversations with Susan Giroux, The Threat of Race, Reflections on Racial Neoliberalism, and The Future of Thinking, Learning Institutions in a Digital Age with Kathy Davidson. He recently published a fascinating article you can find online called The Afterlife of the Humanities. And Two new books will appear in 2015, Are We All Post-Racial Yet? and Between Humanities and the Digital, an edited volume with Patrick Svensson. He has also blogged quite frequently for platforms such as Huffington Post, Truthout, and Open Democracy. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. David Theo Goldberg. I guess it's still morning. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. I want to thank the organizers, the dean, the um, committee that put this together. And as somebody who, uh, in his day job, sort of puts together events like this uh, with some alacrity, 
uh, the, the kind of hidden invisible labor that makes events like this possible. So uh, a great thank you for having me here uh, and um, uh, I look forward to the conversation uh, to come. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, will intersect quite nicely, I think, with the talks that we've already heard, uh, the really terrific talks we heard um, earlier this morning. Um, I want to step back a little bit uh, and give a, a, a kind of broader register for the issues and debates and concerns around the transformation of the university to put it in, a, in a, a, the context of a kind of changing landscape or ecology uh, of higher edu education today. Uh, and my, my talk will largely be in, in two parts. Uh, I'll try and sort of rush through the first part because the first part is really about the broader context that has uh, produced the transformation of the university uh, as we're coming to experience and as we're living, uh, living it today. And then the second part will be uh, trying to make out an argument for where I think we should be going in relation to uh, is issues um, of, of the digital. Um, so I'm going to start with a series of slides um, and I'm going to talk really to my slides, right? It's not going to be a written paper. Um, and and the, the first four slides are really, in a way, metaphorical, uh, but it'll give you a sense of the transformation over the past 50 years, right? We've gone really from this, right, as our image of the university, first to this in the 1980s, right, the University of California, San Diego Library. Uh, and you can see many examples of great architecture on, on campuses these days, it's sort of flourishing uh, of these things. To this in the 1990s, right, and the, the, the emergence of the for-profit university, uh, which has put great impact uh, on all of, uh, all learners, all young learners in particular, and, and ongoing learners. And then uh, to the, you might say, failed experiment of the MOOC, right? Uh, the MOOC, at the very least, opened up an interesting debate about how teaching and learning might take place, who it's for, in what registers it might uh, be conducted, and so on. Uh, and there was great who plan, it was supposed to you know, save us from all our revenue woes and so on and so forth. None of that has materialized as people are now, I mean, we warned them at the outset, uh, right? Uh, the University of California I'll speak about in a minute, um, you know, was, was weighted in as a way of creating great revenue and uh, saving our revenue woes and none of that has materialized whatsoever. But it has posed the question, how, how do you learn and where do you learn and how do you learn well? And I, I want to come back to that. At the same time, we've seen a transformation, right, in what students, undergraduate students in particular, are registering for, right? So these are kind of interesting figures. Business has tripled in the last 40 years, predictably, right? Uh, communications, journalism increased sevenfold, right? Uh, really interesting. Computer science peaked in the 1980s, dipped in the 1990s, came back again uh, in, in, in the last decade and so on. Uh, the, the dip in the 1990s was, was a little surprising, right? Uh, and then the humanities, right, really peaked in the 1980s, right? When it was 1780, it was really the centerpiece of the university. Uh, and I want to, uh, you know, you could add the social sciences and, and these numbers would almost double. Um, and I'm going to talk about the greater humanities in the sort of Jim Clifford kind of way. The greater humanities as the human sciences, not in the bioscience sense of the human sciences, but in the Dothian sense from the late 19th century Germany, where the human sciences were the greater human or are the greater humanities that incorporate both the traditional humanities and uh, the, the interpretive social sciences. And the humanities then dipped quite seriously. I mean, the, the registration halved in the 1970s and 1980s and then sort of came back a bit in the 1990s and it's steady at about 8%. So all those paranoias that you've heard in the last three or four years about the humanities tanking are not quite true. Actually, the, the numbers have shifted a bit, but they're, they're quite steady at this sort of lower benchmark, right? Uh, and it's given way to the closing of some departments, right? Some language departments, for example. Uh, French uh, at some universities, some colleges have been under duress. German, interestingly, has 
been threatened in, uh, on some campuses, but its registration is up a little bit, like 2% maybe. Arabic, which is not there, has flourished, maybe again predictably, 46% increase. The numbers were very low, so 46% increase might not mean a whole lot, right, to begin with. But it's interesting to see that as social conditions transform, right, our attention to certain kinds of disciplinary formations um, uh, uh, go, al go along with it. Um, so I want to give you, uh, you know, I'll t I, I won't talk specifically to these, I have a series of slides that really uh, point to the, the, the kind of landscape of social economic conditions uh, into which the university has fit over the past five or 10 or 15 years. Uh, and those debates that took place, I'll let you read uh, right, this data. Uh, those debates that took place in the last presidential election in 2012 were very real. I mean, you know, the 1%, the 99%. The Occupy movement, the concerns around who has what and who has nothing, right? The fact that the you know the US likes to think of itself as the greatest show on earth, but when you look at these numbers, it can't be for these reasons. There might be other reasons it's the greatest show on earth, but it can't be for the social economic conditions facing the entire population uh, of the country because the numbers are really dismal when you compare them to other uh, well-developed and industri industrialized countries. Right, so I mean the fact that 43% of Americans have less than $10,000 saved up for retirement should trouble everybody, right? I mean those are really staggering numbers when you come to think about it, right? The, the, the sense in the past is that younger generations would support the retirement of older generations by continuing to pay into Social Security and so on right, is somewhat being eroded in very dramatic terms, right? And societies have often then turned to immigration in order to resolve that, but of course, we're closing our borders to immigration to some degree, right? So even that kind of um, underlying infrastructure uh, is disappearing from us. So the way in which, um, right, the US is the lowest or close to the lowest on any number of registers amongst industrialized countries uh, on, on key indices about socioeconomic well-being, again, should be quite troubling uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. So in, um, right, when we come to California, I mean, California is often regarded as the state that leads the way in all kinds of uh, conditions, both glorifying and horrible, right? Uh, and so I'm going to point to sort of some of the indicators because it, it, you'll recognize uh, broader trends over here. Right, 13% decrease in state higher education budget, right, over the last, uh, uh, that 20-year that or 30-year period. Um, a 435% increase in prison expenditures. I mean, there's a longer story to be told you I won't go into. Uh, but more is being spent today on prisons in the state of California than is being spent on higher education. I mean, pretty staggering, right? And when you think of who's being funneled into the pr what Angela Davis has called the prison industrial complex, you begin to understand what the broader implications are. The state support, I arrived in California in 2000 when I took my position, uh, and the transformation in the budget of the right, of the flagship um, system in public education for the country is quite staggering, right? There was a 27% of the budget of the, sta of, of the University of California, which at the time was $15 billion for all 10 campuses, well, it was nine campuses at that time, now 10, right? 27% um, uh, came from the state, right? It dropped in 2010 to 13%. Right, of a $19 billion budget, and today it's closer to 10% of a $25 billion budget. Right, what has that meant? That's meant a rapid increase, right, a quadrupling in that period of tuition fees, right? So it used to be a totally affordable university, right, now tuition is something like $12,500, and projected to keep rising, right, even though there's a, a, a kind of debate going on with the state. Uh, in one sense, you, you could say it's no longer a public university, right? I mean, its revenue is all coming from, from elsewhere, but for that 10%. Of course, the state owns the land and the buildings and so on and so forth, 
worth a lot of money, but it doesn't pay for the daily bills uh, of the university, and you've got to keep those things uh, running, right? So uh, you can, uh, you know, your, your higher education, in a sense, on speed. I mean, tuition has quadrupled nationwide. This is not just now Californian. Has tripled since 2000, uh, has quadrupled since 2000, right? So the rate of increase has been dramatic right across the country, uh, and indeed in Britain, right, where 9,000 pounds a year to go to university when it used to be free not five years ago, right? So you can see it happening again and again and again, uh, uh, sort of globally, right? Um, student debt average is something like $30,000 per, per student. I'll, I'll give you some more refined figures in a, in a minute. It was something like $10,000 per student in 1993. And in, in the 1980s, when I went, early 1980s, when I went to graduate school, it wasn't quite zero, but it was close, right? It's kind of the academic inflation at the same time, just in tuition terms, right? Two and a half times inflation, right, for the increase in tuition, and uh, four times inf in inflation for, for out of state, right? The, uh, that, that's not great inflation, right? That's tuition inflation, right? Uh, and uh, when you think of the rate of academic inflation overall, and that is the rate of inflation that it takes uh, that it costs to run universities generally, from 1982 to 2007, it was close to 450%. That's almost 20% a year, right? Staggering. I mean, you know, at a time when the rate of inflation through that period averaged maybe 4 or 5% at most, right, generally. So you can see that we're out, we're out living ourselves. We're outstripping ourselves in, in, in dramatic sorts of ways. Uh, seniors' debt, that is debt of uh, seniors in, in your last year at school in 2012. At a public university, just over $25,000. Private university, $32,000. Staggering that for the for-profits, like the University of Phoenix and others, it's, all, it's nearly double, right? Close to double of what it is for public universities. So those figures the, and, and the outcomes of going to a for-profit are dismal. I mean, uh, the capacity to get a job, the, uh, 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 right, the kind of education you get, the training you get, the preparation you get, indeed for life, it's not very good. It's all about making profit uh, in, in that sense. And at the same time, one should say that the state has made just some dismal choices. At the very same time, it's been cutting right, its contribution to higher education. I think here of, of Rutgers University, right, your neighbor down the road, which is a state university system uh, in, in your state, right? The Meadowlands was destroying the Meadowlands Stadium, right? And leaving $225 million in unpaid debt, right? Uh, that it had to pay off on something that was totally unproductive. So it was cutting contributions to higher education. Yes, I know a different account, right? Uh, at the same time that it was having to pay off debt to build a new stadium to develop a parking lot right, for uh, uh, the new stadium. Same in, in Washington, where the University of Washington uh, uh, was being cut to the bone and they, they, they were destroying a stadium there with $80 million debt. So one can ask now, against this background, who are universities for and what are they for, right? And to put that in an historical perspective. I first want to say that if you look back to the expansion of the university system in America in the late 1950s, sort of prompted by the GI Bill, the ending of multiple wars, the beginning of a new war, of course, and so on and so forth. Every decade has its war in America, right, of some kind or another. Um, that the, the university was a middle-classing um, institution, right? It was designed to educate not just the middle classes, but for the middle class, right? It was to turn us into middle class citizens in a variety of complicated ways, and very largely at the time for white students, white men and, and increasingly women as they were coming into the academy. That didn't change really until the 1960s. It began a bit earlier, but really the, the development of that transformation uh, really began to take place in the 1960s. And the kind of knowledge, right, that was being purveyed, classical, canonical knowledge that was being purveyed at the time, is represented, 
right, by the images that have appeared on every philosophy department's website, right, around the world since then, right, the School of Athens and Rodin's Thinker, right? I mean, those are the, you know, think back to the image I had for student debt, right? It's a kind of uh, similar thing. So, so the way, you know, who the university is serving, what it was supposed to be doing, and the kind of canonical knowledge that it was producing, right, uh, is, is, is tied up together in what I'm calling this kind of social ecology. That began to change, as I say, in the 1960s and into the 70s and 80s as the university became a bit more heterogeneous, right? And now, I mean, this could be any university website that you would find, you know, we produce a diverse and inclusive learning environment. If you look at the numbers, the numbers don't quite tell that story, right? It's kind of, it's better than it was, but it's not quite there, right? And so, right, I, you know, um, you can ask sort of how diverse, how heterogeneous are the, you know, this audience is fantastic. And the humanities have tended, right, to recognize that it needs, you know, it addresses heterogeneous sort of populations and so on. And it has to rethink itself in relation to that set of concerns, right? But if you look at the university more broadly, and this image might shock a bit, but it's the great Jean-Michel Basquiat, you know, the fear, fear of the black planet, right? I mean, there's a kind of 20% rule. When the university gets more than 20% diverse, which is to say more than 20% of not white students, the doors start closing down. And I think I have data evidence I could produce for that uh, in, in, in a different talk, right? And the contrast with that, and of course, I mean, you've all been following the Keen, right, Halloween party in New Hampshire, right, where there was a, like a mini riot, right? Twitter was alive with the debate, right, about uh, the representation of what happened in Ferguson and the representation of what happened here. Right, racially inscribed in relation to Ferguson, uh, racially kind of erased in relation, all white, right? Um, uh, turning over cars, I mean, looks like a, a kind of urban war zone, uh, in a sense. Um, and I just want to add that, you know, that concern about the lack of diversity is represented at a campus like UCLA. After 1997, when the state of California outlawed the use of affirmative action uh, for public institutions, Right? You can no longer uh, engage affirmative action in order to get a more diverse population. The, um, the registration of undergraduate students at UCLA went down to then less than 2%. It's now at 2%, half of whom are student athletes. Right? So 1% of the overall undergraduate population at UCLA right? Are, are there for academic reasons, other than sports reasons, right? It's kind of, and uh, a group of young black men, particularly impacting young black men, didn't, you, you could, again, this video is, is up on internet and you can go and check it out on YouTube. Uh, a really great um, video about feeling unwanted at a campus, flagship campus of the University of California. And so I want to say, link that to the kind of diversity that is produced, right, for Silicon Valley and the likes of Silicon Valley, right? Where black folk are pretty much invisible, right? There's a great debate about the lack of diversity taking place in Silicon Valley at the moment. Its diversity is largely Asian, right? I mean, for the most part, uh, when it comes to it. And, and one has to think about how we're thinking about the university in relation to the production of this, these sorts of outcome, right? Um, and so, right, this declaration of public no more, this unfortunately, Andrew Policano, right, is a former dean of the University of, of Business at the University of California, Irvine, my campus, right? So I'm a bit ashamed, sort of, but, but it's, it's, it's revealing that the argument they make is that the public no more university, that University of California that I pointed to, Right? which is no longer really supported by the state in any huge sense, right? although the 10% of the budget is not unimportant. Right? They argue right, that if any, um, uh, any knowledge formation within the university is unable to pay its own way, is unable to produce its own revenue, external grants, endowment, foundation grants, uh, revenue generation through tuition fees and so on, it no longer belongs at the contemporary university. 
And of course, what they name are the humanities and interpretive social sciences, like anthropology, right? So this should be of intense concern to us. I mean, this is a contemporary argument. This book's two years old, right? Um, and it represents a broader frame of thinking, right, around what the future of the university would look like. Uh, and it's, in a way, compounded by some very interesting initiatives around do-it-yourself universities, which are not unimportant, right? I mean, for reasons I'll come to in, in, in due course, right? I mean, who would want, not want to go to a university called the super cool school, right? I mean, why would you not want to do that, right? I mean, it sounds like the cool thing. I mean, peer-to-peer -peer university, which was co-founded by a very good friend, Philip Schmidt, has done really interesting experimental stuff in terms of opening up how one creates course content together that's open, that's openly produced and openly distributed, uh, and for all intents and purposes is free, right? So that also puts right, impact on uh, the, the, the state of the university uh, as well. So that finishes the first part of the talk, and I want now to move to the second part, which is beginning to make out an argument against this background. Right? Manuel Castells, the great sociologist, in his book on network societies, lays out three, three criteria for a network or networking economy. Right? The first is networking technologies. We all have them. You're all you know, plugging away, I can see, uh, right, at networking te technologies. So that is you know, to some large degree already in place. A workforce trained and organized for networks, for networking. That's in process but hasn't yet materialized. Right? And then a new mode of organizing, including knowledge organization, around networking. Right? So those are the three criteria. And if you think about the university, it's at best, at best minimally, partially sort of organized in, re in, in relation to this. And the question is, how do you organize in relation to this networking economy in every sense of the term economy, the kind of economy of the social um, uh, that, that we are now facing? If you think back to the founding moment of the National Endowment of the Humanities in 1964-65, right, an act of Congress, right, very interesting the terms, right, in which it presents itself. I mean, they seem somewhat classical, right, if you look at the specific language, right, the way in which, um, right, a great power cannot support itself simply through power, right, but needs to lead through... Um, uh, uh, through ideas uh, and the spirit, right, uh, in a way much lost in the current vision of sort of contemporary uh, America. And one can ask oneself what, what that means. I mean, the argument for the humanities was that it's crucial, right, to the national condition, right, that you can't have a citizenry not trained in and through the humanities and expect to be a leading entity in the world. So we can begin to address um, uh, Jamie Bianco, uh, very nicely made the contrast between literacies and fluencies, and I want to think of literacies in the sense of fluency, uh, uh, in the sense, not just a kind of rote repeating so that you think you know all the terms and the syntax and semantics and so on, right? And if you think of, right, what it means to be fluent or literate in an information society, in an, in an information age. It requires these multiple, not just discrete, but intersecting forms of fluency, of literacy, uh, to, to which one uh, has to be engaged. And that, of course, then calls on institutions of learning, not just education, but of learning, right, in, to organize themselves sort of in these terms. And if you think of humanities literacies, you can divide them into something like these three, I don't want to call them silos, interactive, right, um, uh, sort of bins, right? First, the cultural, the substantive, right, that includes the linguistic, uh, but religions, literatures, histories, uh, cultural um, um, uh, conditions and, and uh, understanding uh, and, um, <clears throat> and interpretation. Uh, the visual, increasingly important, 
always been there, actually. I mean, think of medieval manuscripts, right? I mean, you can't read a medieval manuscript without paying attention to the visual, right? Um, so still on moving images, their syntax and semantics. Uh, and then the techno-scientific, right? And, uh, the techno-scientific is an increasingly important part uh, of all of this, as some people have uh, pointed out uh, in, in the earlier talk. So what do we mean by the humanities in all of this? I have a very capacious, almost imperialistic kind of conception of the humanities. Anything that has to do with meaning, value, and significance puts us there, right? When you think about any conditions, any circumstances, any structures, any representation in which meaning, value, and significance are key features, that makes the humanities present. That means pretty much everything. Right? That means that we're in business. We're in the sciences. Right? We're in the technical disciplines and so on. So what do I mean by translating ourselves to ourselves? So let me give you an example so registered by this image. Right? The humanities have always been about interpreting the nature of the human. That's what makes it the humanities. Right? Think back to Aristotle or Plato. Right? Think back to the 18th century. Right? Mary Wollstonecraft and, and so on and so forth. Right? Think back to the great Timbuktu manuscripts and so on and so forth. Right? We've always been about thinking about who we are in relation to the world and others in the world in relational senses of the term. Right? That sense has transformed rather dramatically today. Right? You know, many of us, I won't say all of us, but many of us have technology kind of embedded in us. Right? There's a, an embedding of senses in animals, right? in um, uh, uh, non-movable things, in stones, in the environment, and so on that measures temperature, that measures movement, that measures, all, you know, produces data about all kinds of things. That collapses in that kind of anthropocenic way. It collapses the distinction between the human and the natural, right? It collapses, indeed, the distinction between the human, the natural, and the technological, right? Where do you draw the lines? I mean, if you've got a pacemaker, right? If you have an artificial hip, right, or anything like that, Right, where does the, techni the technological end and the natural begin and the human extension of that sort of materialize? Right? Those distinctions are collapsing. So translating ourselves to ourselves is something which is constantly having to be renewed. We have to ask ourselves, in the face of these transforming conditions, what makes us human today? Right? And what makes us human differently than other humans? Right? Not least in the face of something like Ebola, right? as we'll come back to. This has also meant that we have to start thinking differently about the nature of work. Right? The nature of work has transformed dramatically over time. We are working in different places. We are working with different technologies. We are working in different relations to each other. We are working under different, right, sometimes rather depressing conditions. Right? And so we have to think, right, in the humanities, in the institutions of higher learning, how we organize ourselves. Right? I, you know, when I say this to, to colleagues, um, uh, faculty at my institution, I say, well, you've got to start thinking differently about how you organize your knowledge formation in order to produce students who are ready to go out into the world and engage the world in these sorts of ways. They say, I'm not trained to do that. I'm trained to produce people who do research who will then go to graduate school and replace me. But they're not going to replace you because those jobs are no longer there, right? So you have to be thinking differently yourself about how you are doing these things. Right? So what you can ask, should every student, every undergraduate student know? And I want to call these something like portable capacities or portable fluencies, right? And this is just a beginning list of the kinds of things that from the point of view of the humanities, and they're fairly classical when you come to think about it, right? <laughs> Renewed in the way we conduct them and implement them and teach them and so on, but they're fairly classical. I mean, logical thinking. Who would not want to think logically, recognize arguments, the relation between, right, um, 
assumptions and conclusion and so on and so forth. I mean, it's Aristotelian, practical reasoning, right? Um, the, the nature of analysis. Composition and writing, and I mean by composition, I mean the, uh, the earlier speakers, uh, at least two of them, both spoke about composition, right? That composition is not merely composition in that old classical way of composing a text, right? One means by composition multimodal, multimediated composition, right? And so one needs to become familiar with what it takes to produce compelling works in multimedia uh, composition of the kind we, we saw in the earlier uh, <clears throat> presentations, right? Uh, rhetorical capacity, right? Uh, which is different than simply being able to speak, but using various forms of media to be uh, rhetorically persuasive in a variety of ways. Um, global, cultural, and historical literacies, right? So we need to know everything, right? There's a kind of epistemological drive that kicks into place over here. And of course, the capacity to collaborate uh, the humanities have this image, a uh, Rodin's thinker, right? The humanities have this image of working on your own, right? When in fact, when you write a book, you don't work on your own, even if you're the sole author, right? You deal with librarians, you interact. I, I, I talk about um, collaboration in and, you know, or interdisciplinarity in and, and disciplinarity and uh, out, right, in, in some sense. Well, maybe we should think about, you know, collaboration out as well. Right, the, where the product is fashioned uh, in, in the outcome, and so one can ask, right? Again, harking back to earlier presentations about whether we need to include in this list something like coding. So I'm going to disagree a little bit with some of the earlier speakers. Right? I think coding is important. Set of languages, right? It enables us to do a whole range of things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But not everybody's like necessarily needs to code. Some people, like everything else, code better than other people, right? I think what is necessary is understanding what one can do with coding. Right? That's different necessarily than coding itself, right? Um, now, so this is not an argument that you shouldn't learn how to code, right? If you want to learn how to code, all power to you. I think back to the debates in the 1970s and 1980s in the discipline in which I was trained, which is philosophy on logic. Right? I had to pass a PhD exam in logic, right? even though right, my substantive error was social, political, and ethical theory. Right? Um, and I ended up teaching kind of introduction to logic as I started out in my, in my career, and it was helpful and, and so on. But I mean, I don't use formal logic today in my daily sort of educational and learning, teaching life, and so on. Right? And, yeah, I wonder whether coding is something like that. There are great coders. I employ some of them, right? I interact with them in order to say, hey, I wanted to do X, Y, and Z. Help me think this out, right? And that's what collaboration in the end means, right? It means that you need to understand what you can produce out of coding, not necessarily that you need to code yourself, right? That's slightly different than the earlier arguments. Similarly with STEM, I mean, right, all this emphasis on STEM over the last five or, or so years, right, turns out that there are not enough jobs for the students that are coming out being STEM trained, right? So there's an oversupply of STEM trained people given the number of jobs available. Hey, the humanities, we're here, right? It's a kind of... Um, and then, you know, likewise, you could say the same thing with statistics. These are things we should understand in their basic capacities and what they enable, right, what they afford us uh, in, in, in the common language, right? Um, but do we all have to be, you know, basically uh, extensively trained in it? And so the question about big data, I mean, right, all this production of, of big data, I mean, on a daily basis, your data, on a minute by minute basis, you, you get online, your data is being collected, right? These huge data sets that are being collected. Um, and what is the relation to, you know, and the, the, the relation between secrecy and transparency, these big debates that are taking place in our society um, about you know, databases being hacked and our personal information being made readily available and whether we should, whether there's any such thing as privacy at all today. And these are all humanistic questions, right? All questions that, that we cannot answer without thinking about 
the humanities and its histories, right, which have produced serious engagements around the set of questions. So we can say, well, what about the greater humanities and big data, right? Susan Etlinger, who's not trained as a humanist, she's actually a digital analyst for a major corporation, right, gave a wonderful TED talk. You can go and look it up, right, 15 minute TED talk, in which she made out the most uh, effective case for the humanities that you know, uh, I've heard from pretty much anybody, including deans at universities and so on and so forth, right? And so the questions that get raised by the humanistic in relation to big data, the relevance of the data, right? How is it relevant, right? Uh, asking the right question or questions of the data, right? Those are social issues, social questions, right? And being trained in the humanistic, I mean, when you... When you think of you know, people like Steve Jobs sort of making out, you know, Jobs always said that you know, um, Google, uh, just to give you a concrete example, let's, let's move away from Jobs uh, for, for a minute, right? Two years ago, um, a, um, Melissa Mayer, who, who's now the head of Yahoo but was then at Google, gave a talk at Stanford where she said, over the next year, we will be hiring 8,000 people at Google. 80% of those people will be trained in the humanities. Right? Think about that for a moment. A major data corporation, right? a major corporation that is central to our everyday lives, whether you like it or not, right? is hiring three times as many people trained in the humanities exactly because they're trained in these capacities. They're able to listen carefully. They're able to read. They're able to analyze. They're able to... Uh, argue logically and compellingly and so on and so forth, right, in multi-mediated ways. And so it, you know, that puts the pressure on ourselves as humanists to say, how do we reorganize the humanities to be more effective in producing these sorts of outputs, to use the language of Google, right? It's kind of so what is the university we are for, right? Very easy to provide an account of the university we're against, right? We've all heard it ad infinitum. And so I've been running a sort of series of workshops around the university we are for and produced very interesting responses. For one, right, think of, right, public no more in contrast to not-for-profit, right? What does it mean to be a not-for-profit institution that is supported by the society for which it's producing crucial sets of um, uh, um, uh, people who will then occupy uh, uh, leadership positions across the society, right? The second is to think about the world in terms of critical conditions. And I mean living in a critical condition in at least both senses of the term, right? Living in a crit I mean, Wayne, New Jersey was struck by criticality a couple of years ago when Sandy kind of washed through its streets, right? This is not just Africa or South Asia or some, some, somewhere remote that is not going to touch us. It's round the corner, right? California is sitting, you know, the, the, the School of Engineering, great engineers, right? The School of Engineering at UC San Diego is built right on a fault, right? You, you, you could have thought that they would have figured this out, right? It's a kind of, I mean, it's a school of engineering after all, right? So none of us is immune to this sense of living in critical, and how do we think about criticality in relation to critical conditions, right? And indeed, right, when one thinks about the, the archive of the humanistic, right, they're great resources to turn to. I mean, much the way that we were given a lesson in TEI for poetry, think of Percy Bishop Shelley's fabulous poem, England, in, in, um, 200 years ago, right? And I'll leave you to actually go and look this up and pass through it, right? I mean, the reference late, a Senate times worse stature unrepealed. I mean, think of that in relation to the current condition of the political today, right? It's kind of, so there are ways in which this reveals to us an understanding about our lives that we wouldn't have but for the insight of a great thinker 
uh, like this, right? And talk about living in a critical condition. I mean, the absolute right paranoia that is right in the state, right, by your governor, right, in relation to the critical condition of Ebola, not to make light of Ebola. I mean, it's a horrible condition, but to get a the facts straight and then to ask how we respond to it, right, uh, in a way that is humane, in a way that right? The humanities can draw our attention to uh, uh, becomes uh, critically important. So that said, I want to talk a bit about network cultures, right? In uh, now turning to um, more concretely to sort of technologies, right? The traditional um, three R's of the humanities, you all know what they are, right? Reading, writing, not arithmetic, but reasoning is the third one, right? So reading, writing, reasoning, are the three R's to which we should attend, right? And each of them, right, has been transformed by technological innovation, right? We read very differently than we once did. I mean, just think about hyperlinks and, uh, and so on, right? Um, right? We don't always start at the beginning and end at the end, right? Uh, indeed, uh, the, the terrific um, initiative um, of an online multimedia humanistic uh, um, um, uh, uh, what if I'm using the word um, uh, journal right uh, vectors uh, run out of um, run out of the University of Southern California by Terry McPherson right uh, it was exactly about not reading in linear terms, right? I mean, if you go and look at Vector's articles, I mean, they're really, really interesting, that you read in all sorts of ways, right? Uh, starting in the middle, going to the end, coming back to the middle, whatever, right? So we read very differently than we once did. We compose, as I said earlier, very, very differently. And as Professor Bianco and, and others sort of pointed out, and uh, Professor Carter pointed out earlier, we compose very differently than you know, writing in longhand or even typing things out, as the dean pointed out, uh, that, than we once did. And indeed, our sense of reasoning, right? I mean, that relation, but that anthropocenic, that right, uh, relation between reasoning and the, the, flat, the, 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 the collapsing of the distinction between the human and the technological. So it becomes uh, crucial in a variety of ways. So how then to think about learning, capacious learning, all kinds of learning, where the boundaries are not just driven by the, right, the, the, the disciplines as we've come to inherit them. We've developed at the, uh, at the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub in relation to that, uh, a notion of connected learning. Now, collected learning is driven by this set of criteria. It's interest or passion driven, right? That is, you know, what, what, are you, what are you fueled by? What is your concern? What are you passionate about, right? And to start there and start there and move outwards from there, developing your passions over, over time, right? It's peer-to-peer, -peer, right? That is, it's between learners themselves. It's not hierarchical, right? Between a teacher and the learner. It's open and shared. Right? That is, anybody can make a contribution right? in a variety of ways. Uh, and one can speak longer about this. It's, of course, sorry, it's networked. It's learning by doing, not in the sense simply of you have to make something, but of doing things together. Right? Uh, I often, when I teach, uh, have my students figure out together what their final outcome, or right? uh, not a paper, will be. Right? They have to figure it out. I mean, if the class is big, they break into groups. They have to figure it out themselves. They have to then develop what it is that they're doing together. Right? And they learn as much from the doing together as they, and if not more, and differently than writing a 20-page paper they'll you know, get a grade on and then throw away and never think about it again. Right? Uh, it can be very transformative. Um, it's socially connected in a variety of ways, and it's fully participatory. Now, in the sense of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, engagement, there's a difference between hierarchical peer-to-peer. -peer. Anybody know what this image is from? Right, the original frontispiece of Hobbes's Leviathan, right, 1651. 
right? Uh, and what it, you know, if you look carefully, the body of the sovereign, of the king, is made up by the people, right? So these are individual people. And, you know, if you read the Leviathan, as you all should, great work, right? You'll, you'll notice that the interactive, the contractual engagement is between the people and then the people as a whole with the sovereign who has sovereignty over them. So that's hierarchical. If you translate that into learning, that's what I'm calling hierarchical peer-to-peer uh, -peer engagement. In contrast to a kind of horizontal peer-to-peer -peer, where the interaction right, is not some master teacher uh, and, and everybody else sitting passively, as you are, sorry. Um, but, right, a, a more engaged set of uh, un undertakings. And that puts pressure on how as much we teach as we learn, importantly, right? And so you can ask where learning actually takes place, right? I mean, classically, it takes place in the classroom. I'll have an example of this in a minute. In a lab or a studio, there are great examples of humanities labs. I think of the Haiti lab at Duke, Duke Franklin Humanities Institute, right? Where teaching, learning, research, undergraduate, graduate, faculty are taking place simultaneous, simultaneously together, interactively in the set of engagements. And the teacher is learning as much from the learners as the learners are, uh, um, are, are learning from each other. And of course, uh, than online, right? So if you think about anywhere, anytime learning, which was a notion that came out of the Digital Media and Learning Initiative that MacArthur funded about 10 years ago, right? You'll see that learning literally takes place wherever. There's no limit to where learning takes place. And if learning takes place wherever, we have to be open to the inf institutional structures and infrastructures that enable that set of possibilities. Right? So when one thinks of authoritative learning, I mean, you've all had experiences of this, I'm sure, right? The Econ 101 class with 500 students in it, right? Maybe it's not as bad here because you're a smaller campus, right? Um, but, you know, sage on the stage, sitting at the front of the uh, lecture room, sort of uh, talking at people. And then that translated into this with respect to MOOCs, right? I mean, literally talking almost to nobody. Right? Other than 100,000 people sort of worldwide who might then listen to it. You think of the San Jose experiment with Michael, uh, with uh, what's his name? Michael, uh, the communitarian guy, right? It's kind of, um, um, right, where everybody had to listen to the great Harvard scholar talking about justice. The philosophy department at San Jose said, not us, right? Uh, and it was a failed experiment, as it turned out, right? Precisely because learning is not passive, right? Um, and here you see the contrast between a kind of teacher-directed, the classic model of, uh, of teaching, right, and a kind of learner-directed where the, where the teacher becomes facilitator, one node among others in the interaction that takes place, right, uh, and guides to some degree sort of things that are taking place. That the kind of peer-to-peer -peer engagements, right, uh, become driving of the condition of learning um, it, it itself, right? And there's a, an initiative that has developed sort of predicated on the, on the set of assumptions called Connected Courses. You can go and look it up. Uh, so people like Jim Groom, um, Mike Wesh, uh, Michael Wesh, uh, Jim Groom at Mary Washington, Michael Wesh at Kansas State, uh, Howard Rheingold, right? Sort of impresario extraordinaire who's everywhere, Stanford, Berkeley, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and others, uh, Liz Loesch and so on and so forth, um, Lisa Nakamura, FemTechNet and so on and so forth. Just a whole range of engagements around providing the infrastructure for what connected learning might be so that one doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, right? Every time you undertake to teach an open connected uh, course in these sorts of ways. Where the, where the content of the course and the learning that takes place in the court is widely available, contributed to by anybody who's able to sign up for this uh, endeavor. The question, of course, is its scalability, right? I mean, are one, is one able to scale a model like this in a way that uh, universities will pay uh, attention to? And so just let me quickly end by just pointing to a couple of other initiatives, Connected Histories, 
right? Uh, driven out of the world history formation, uh, interesting sort of undertaking. Uh, there are a couple of maps I'll show you. Uh, Patricia Seed's maps. Um, um, Todd was uh, talking about uh, geospatial mapping and Port Portuguese mapping and, and uh, Europe. Uh, Pat Seed has digitized uh, all of the early Portuguese maps of West Africa from something like 1480 to 1530 uh, that looked like this and which is having a great impact on, on slave trade routes or routes, right? Uh, um, because indicating you know, where the contemporary places are in relation to where the map places are uh, that people didn't quite have a sense of, which couldn't have been done without digitizing them, actually. It allowed one to actually map one onto the um, uh, other, um, right? Uh, and this brings me to a sense of what I would call relational learning, right? That, um, that we, we cannot learn any longer kind of discreetly about anything, right? That things are deeply related and connected than the other sense of connection, right? Deeply connected, they open up you know, new modes of learning. I mean, the Harlem Renaissance, Renaissance opened up Black Paris, right, as a connected, a related mode uh, of, of, of learning in a variety of ways. And if you think of, I mean, to go back to the Sandy kind of case, right, the relation between, you know, a, a, an American continental size pollution in the Pacific Ocean of plastic, right? I mean, troubling, huh? It's kind of... So an area, a geographical area, the size of the United States, right, of just floating, right, discarded plastic polluting the ocean, right, connected to uh, polar melts, right, and collect, connected then to the rising sea levels in the Maldives, right. Those things are deeply connected both in uh, scientific terms, Right? and in humanistic terms, human terms, to each other, and to be able to understand our world today, you have to understand those uh, connections somehow with each other. And then, of course, the coming innovations in mobile learning, which one could talk, uh, you know, both learning off your, your mobile platform. Um, there's some great experiments in places like India, Delhi, uh, throughout Africa, you know, uh, predicated on M-banking and so on, where the technology has already been produced uh, in, in a variety of ways. But where, you know, literally anytime, anywhere learning on your mobile, right? Uh, when you're driving to, you know, you're, you're on the subway or, uh, you're, you know, obviously takes place on a plane and so on and so forth. I mean, all over the place learning and how one then connects that into a way which is recognized, right, assessed, and um, given a kind of attribution, right, through what we're calling now digital badging, you know, not your gamification of learning, uh, right? There are experiments, there's a, uh, for example, at UC Davis, um, a food and agricultural studies program that has uh, deployed b digital badging uh, for assessment and accreditation. Right? And the question becomes how you develop a kind of ecology that that thing can be posted on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever and become a mode of get vets, for example, being recognized uh, right for the learning that they've acquired as vets in the army and then sort of coming into um, uh, civilian life and being able to get jobs in, in civilian life and so on uh, becomes a, a, a new mode. So I want to end just by asking a bit provocatively, what a world or a university would look like, as Policano et al. suggested, should be without the humanities, right? A university in the world without the humanities would literally not be the university as we know it. It would not be a university. It would be a kind of technical learning place. And we'd be dramatically the poorer for it, right? So that puts a responsibility on us, right? Not just to get with the program, but actually to rethink what we're doing in the humanities and how the long you know, 3,000, 4,000 year history of the humanities can be reconfigured right, for the times in which we live. And I'll end by saying there ain't no exit. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, one has to start with um, the very early texts in the humanities to figure that one out, right? Um, so what does it mean to be human? Uh, in our, uh, you know, there's an emerging debate around the notion of the Anthropocenic, right? The Anthropocenic is this new fancy term for the collapsing of the human and the natural realms, and I would add the technological realms over here, right? Uh, where in geological terms, right, the, um, uh, in, in geological terms, right, where ge geological formations were produced completely naturally, the impact of human interventions on the lived environment is beginning to tra transform the way in the way which impacts global warming and so on and so forth, uh, climate change, polar melts, and, and so on, dramatically impact the actual physical environment in a way that <coughs> right, prior to the last 30 years would, would have been absolutely uh, unimaginable. Right? Uh, and that collapsing of, you know, if you think of Donna Haraway's work of uh, the, the collapsing of nature culture, Right? The way in which right, the human and the, um, uh, and the natural are deeply imbricated with each other, are deeply implicated in their co-formation, right? uh, which is, you know, uh, if not dramatically different, constitutively different, has dramatically speeded up in the last half century. Um, that, ha that begins to transform how we think about the human. We have capacities we didn't once have. Right? We have the capacities to communicate across vast differences more or less instantaneously. I mean, get on a Google Hangout right? and see your colleague or relative or friend or whatever right? uh, you know, who's already living in the tomorrow, literally. Right? Uh, and that's very different than you know, having to get on a boat and sail for six weeks or three weeks or 11 days or whatever. Um, right? and, and so it transforms not just how we think about the world, but the world itself in a way that's also impacting the natural environment. So we're thinking the human differently than the human used to be thought, right? Uh, along with, uh, you know, there's that great, comes from Jean Locke um, in the 17th century. Uh, you know, you change one plank on a ship, it's the same ship, right? You change two planks, you change 10 planks, you change all the planks, right? Still the same shape, Still the same cabin, still the same. Is it the same ship, right? I mean, are you able to name it the same ship? Well, think about, right, that in relation, I mean, um, uh, Quine, the logician, took that up in, in, in ways in relation to logical formation and so on. But um, think about, about what that means when you begin to change, you know, oh, I got a heart transplant. Oh, I got a kidney transplant. Oh, I got a lung transplant. Oh, now I've got you know, a few other technological devices driving me in the world, right? Oh, my name's Stephen Hawking, right? Um, what's not human about him, right? I mean, of all the people in the world, I mean, you know, he's somebody I would point to as somebody who lives a really human life, right? Um, so, you know, those distinctions are starting to collapse and, and thinking about um, Tony Judd, before he died, sort of was reflective about the condition. He died under rather um, painful circumstances, uh, uh, stricken, riven by a disease where he was immobilized and actually couldn't talk, right? It's kind of, uh, uh, and had to be technologically enabled. And literally until his last moment was reflecting on the very nature of that condition for what it means to be human uh, in, in the world today. And, and, and so the examples of reflection on that very space of, of um, the collapsing uh, between the technological and the human. Yeah. Well, I don't have a mic, so I'll try and talk as loud. I'll, I'll repeat if. Um, <laughs> so I'm a philosophy major, so you are a man after my heart. But, uh, I wanted to bring up something that I worry about in relation to the things that you've addressed in terms of the future of the humanities is uh, I work particularly in philosophy of mind and I'm in the neuropsychology honors track and I do research and I work in a lab, but I also, you know, long term I want to go into a PhD program in philosophy and I would like to do my work in philosophy. So on one hand, you know, the future of the humanities is of critical relevance to me as a student, but 
I also see through my research, through my kind of one foot in the door of the sciences, I see and worry deeply about the kind of um, uh, epistemological uh, structure of the sciences. So I, I mean, I, I see a very um, uh, significant difference talking to a bio major and what they think it means to be right or what causality is or how they can be sure of something or the implications of something or if it's right to, for example, map everything in the human genome, you know, they, I, I find that their questions are not centered on the things that the humanities is centered on, and I, I think that without that balance, it becomes very difficult to even really think about the future of the sciences, truthfully. Um, so I was wondering if you could see. Yeah, great, great question. I, you know, you should be in any philosophy program you want to get into in a PhD level. Great, really great questions. So, um, you know, the, the, um, this points to a number of things. I mean, the first thing I think I want to say in response is that um, the way you've raised the questions makes it imperative that um, somebody trained in philosophy in the way you, you are training be present at the table uh, in relation to scientific work. Right, that I think it's crucially important. I'll give you a couple of examples in order to bear this out. There's been some interesting work developing around um, the, the genome project and race. Right? I mean, in a way, you know, on one hand, the argument is that the genome project, because of individualized DNA and so on and so forth, completely does away with any racial consideration. On the other hand, it's like, well, there are these statistical runs where you're able to account for certain diseases right among certain populations, whether it's Jews and Thai sacs or whether it's blacks and um, uh, other diseases and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and so race gets kind of resurrected, right? And there's been some very interesting epistemological work, right, by people like... Um, uh, um, Nadia Abu al Haj at, um, uh, at C Columbia, the, um, uh, in, in the anthropology of, uh, of race formation in relation to genomic uh, testing, looking particularly at Jews, right? Um, uh, or um, a, a colleague here now down the road, she just moved here, uh, Rua Benjamin, who's moved to Princeton. Right in uh, African American studies, he's, he's doing fabulous works of uh, along similar lines, or Duena for Wiley at, at at Stanford and so on, where they're looking exactly at the kind of ways in which the sciences, you know, or genetic sciences in particular, silently um, deploy epistemological assumptions, right, without kind of being honest about it. Right? in ways that produce outcomes that are driven by the very things that they're assuming. Right? So, kind of, so the work, I, you know, I, I, I uh, encourage you to go and look at their work. It's very careful and very, very well done. It, so either in the kind of sociology of epistemology sort of uh, uh, kind of work. Um, so, um, you know, to come back to my original point, I think it's crucial that in, not just in learning and studying, but in the actual running of projects, right, in a variety of ways that humanists, a, a kind of retooled humanist, right, be at, or set of humanists, be at the table, right, um, in the formation of the projects themselves, right? Uh, and I know scientists will go, oh, yeah, please, right? So kind of, but, uh, uh, but it produces a, a questioning at the base level of what the assumptions of the uh, of, of the project are. Oh, you think of water delivery. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about this because, of course, in California, we're going through a very, the southwest generally, we're going through a very, very severe drought. Uh, and nobody in Southern California, at least, is paying any attention to this, right? It's kind of, I mean, you turn on your hose as you would have as, as if the reservoirs were full. And, and it, it can't be simply that the technological will fix this. Right? I mean, human beings relate to water in complicated ways, right? And so when you have a kind of understanding of the meanings and values and significance of water, to go back to my original sort of sense of things, it begins to impact how people behave in relation to water. What, what they're, what, you know, what they're find, ugh, I, you know, I couldn't drink recycled 
you know, uh, um, lavatory water. Or I couldn't, you know, drink um, desultified water from right, from the sea or whatever. I mean, right? I mean, people have, and one has to understand sort of where uh, all that comes from, and and uh, that's a complicated matter. One other thing in relation to your question, there's been some very very interesting work on the flip side uh, around reading, right? So there's a person, I think she's uh, at. Michigan State, uh, who's both trained in literature and, uh, and neurological sciences. And she's doing studies of um, how reading for pleasure and reading for study produces different neur neurological responses. It's, it's really, really, really interesting stuff. Right? And, and the, 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 at least the initial data that she's producing uh, has shown a quite striking distinction between the two. Uh, which, of course, then has implications for learning. Right? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just calling. Yeah, go ahead. We have time for one more. Right. Um, you see, you have a, it seems like you have a lot of uh, opinions on things you want to change at the institutional level, whether it's tuition, minority representation, and, and how things are done at the curricular level, right? Um, how are you? And they're connected. How, how are you and other colleagues who shame the Sarah? How are you and other colleagues who share the same opinion working together to enact those changes? Yeah, well, I, good question, very fair question. Um, so I pointed to some of the some of the curricular sort of set of considerations around connected learning. So you can go and um, you know in in the shorthand you can go and look at Connected Learning Alliance, CL Alliance, all one word dot uh, org, um, uh, where there's a whole slew of uh, material in relation to the kinds of learning programs, both K through 12 and, and beyond, um, right around uh, re reorganizing learning. Uh, you know, uh, institutions of a higher learning are very slow to respond, right? I mean, they're slow moving ships, right? For better and for worse, right? And so it takes um, doing discrete programming of the kind, some of which one's heard over here, and then sort of higher order engagement, uh, you know, with, with people, uh, uh, administrators and so on, uh, as, as well as, you know, the Department of Education with whom we've been in, uh, in conversation, foundations like the MacArthur Foundation, uh, the Gates Foundation, which is a more difficult foundation to move, less creative uh, in its response, right? Uh, and to think long-term about the relation between the kind of transformational learning that is taking place K through 12 and the sort of learning and the kind of learning, uh, forms of learning taking place uh, in higher education. I mean, if we're going to have any impact, right, if, if, if we're going to transform the kind of K through 12 learning <clears throat> taking place in, in the way the DML initiative is, is, is sort of driving towards, uh, and it's had some impact, uh, some are considerable, some not. Uh, when those students enter higher education, right, and higher education is the same as it was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we're lost, right? Because, I mean, uh, and so there's an imperative to actually begin to think ecologically about the, the, the system and, and to think this together, um, you know, now, the, the other pieces, I mean, diversity, uh, right, is on one hand related and on one hand not related. I mean, it, it has its own set of histories that one needs to understand what produces that. Um, the, the sense of loss of control of things that were once controlled by certain sets of population, right, the opening up of resources, the increased competitiveness, uh, I mean, all of that sort of kicks into place and becomes quite complicated uh, in, in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, what I will say is that there's some very interesting work um, in, you know, that, that is also important. Um, people like uh, Craig Watkins in, uh, at the University of Texas and so on, uh, around the fact that uh, the, the creative use of technology by um, kids of color, right, is quite different than the use of technology about, by white kids. And one might attend to that, right? Not, not just around gaming, right? But actual interactive engagements with peer-to-peer -peer engagements with each other. To, to look at, you know, again, peer-to-peer -peer 
interest, passion driven, right? When you begin to think in those terms, you begin to transform the very terms of not a top down kind of learning, but a kind of uh, a, a, a more flattened out kind of peer to peer engagement with each other. Sorry that we are out of time. Let's uh, have a look. Thank you.